understand what you're doing. Obviously, it also leads us to, the, to discuss the oral systemic connection and what is this now as this turns chronic and systemic. Uh, the oral systemic connection is simply defined as bacteria, endotoxins, and cytokines enter the general circulation through the diseased gum tissue and become available to the rest of the body. And it exerts influences on tissues and organs throughout the rest of the body. We already know on the right side that we have localized connective tissue destruction and the breakdown that results in periodontal disease or gum disease or pyorrhea, whatever the term is that we use. But to fill out, the, the, in all fairness to the equation, we now have to talk about the systemic uh, effects of that very same process as bacteria and endotoxins in the bloodstream circulate through the body and have an effect on distant organ tissues and, and sites and tissues. Which is why we can now say that periodontal disease is linked. That's an important word because we're not saying it's causal or that it, there's a cause effect. We're saying there's a strong connection or a link between periodontal disease and a whole list of medical disorders. So again, the question is, well, how does that happen? What's the common thread that runs through all that and makes all this so? And the answer very much appears uh, as it's emerging in the science to be the issue of systemic inflammation or these proteins that are circulating in my bloodstream that exert an influence on these, on these tissues. When we talk about the accused phase reactant uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, this is basically a schematic showing the cascade again that happens. We have our inflammatory challenge, which provokes a, a, either a cellular or a humoral um, response in, in, through the innate immune system, where we have adhesion molecules, which are the chemokines on the cell walls and so forth, as well as humoral proteins, which are the cytokines that freely, freely are, are moving about on their own in the tissue spaces in the bloodstream, upregulating uh, the liver to produce C-reactive protein. We used to think that CRP was simply a marker, that when we drew it and we looked at it, um, it was simply an indicator of something else going on. It just meant you had inflammation. What we now understand is that CRP itself, as a chemical, is biologically active and can produce inflammation on its own right. So it becomes a feedback loop where when we have elevated systemic inflammation, such as CRP, it itself can produce more systemic inflammation. <coughs> which has some, some profound implications here. Um, from the work of Paul Ridker, who's one of the pioneers in the medical field on the work of CRP, um, this study shows uh, the relative risk of future cardiovascular events uh, of CRP. Um, CRP is something that you can readily obtain. You just send it to the, the person to the blood lab, they pull it out, they measure it, and, and it winds up on the report. And, you, and it'll tell you right on the bottom, uh, uh, a row here, it'll tell you what the number is, and you can see in a relative way what's the relative risk uh, based on the, on the research of a future heart attack. When you set it up against other risk factors and say, well, how does it rate? How important is it? Ridker tells us that high sensitivity CRP, uh, and again, the numbers don't mean anything, but it's the relative differences between these. We, we've, been, we've been on this stump for, what, three or four decades about how bad cholesterol is. And, and it's, it's changed in the food industry and the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry like nothing else. Well, now we have high sensitivity CRP showing up. It, in a relative sense, is more of a problem than cholesterol ever was. But even when it's combined with total uh, cholesterol, you can see how it, it, it makes it even that much worse. So we can't, the point is we can't ignore CRP anymore. This has to be something that we take into consideration. If you really want the, uh, one of the definitive works on this, you can go on Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble, whatever, and get his book on CRP. I would suggest that if you're interested in uh, becoming conversant or at least looking like you're conversant, you probably should have this with you when you talk to a physician. It's very impressive, and there's some very good chapters in here that talk about there's nothing dental or periodontal in it. Um, it's just simply about the science of CRP and how, what it, as it relates to cardiovascular disease. So I would get it, even if you only use it as a prop, and I hope you wouldn't use it just for that. You, you read it, okay? The summary of CRP, it's the body's response to inflammation. It's more predictive of heart disease than cholesterol. It's a causative agent in, in the heart disease process itself. Uh, C-reactive protein is an indication that there's inflammation and infection somewhere in the body. We have to remember that. Just because I send somebody to the lab, they pull blood, the CRP is high, doesn't mean they have periodontal disease. And conversely, just because they have periodontal disease doesn't mean they're going to have elevated C-reactive protein. 
We, we can't say that. That's, and you'd be laughed out of the medical office, uh, rightly so. It just means that somewhere in the body, there is a problem that's producing inflammation. And it could be gout, it could be uh, irritable bowel syndrome, it could be arthritis, it could be their fat or that they smoke, it could be uh, uh, cancer, it, it could be anything that's producing inflammation. It's, it's the red flag we run up the pole and say there is a problem and now the doctor has to, has to act like a, a sleuth to go figure out, well, what is it? Let's ask some questions, let's do some more testing. We do know, however, that it can, uh, that periodontal disease is a primary cause of it. We all know the statistics on who has periodontal disease, and, and that shouldn't surprise us as dentists to, to realize that there's a very high probability of a connection. And we know that we can reduce CRP through appropriate periodontal therapy. So what is cardiovascular disease? This is the old view. This is the way we all grew up, believing that it was sludge that just accumulated passively in the pipes until it became 90% blocked and then everybody panicked and you were on a helicopter and you had your chest cut open and, and we bypassed it. End of story. And this is not the current view. This is the old view. The new view is inflammation is now recognized as the key process in atherosclerosis. It occurs when the monocytes or the white blood cells invade and become active in the wall of the artery. That's basically what cardiovascular disease is about. And this is what it looks like. <clears throat> LDL cholesterol in and of itself is not a problem. It's when it becomes modified. One of the ways it can become modified is through oxidation. There's many other ways it can become modified. But once it becomes modified, then we look at it as a danger. Our immune system looks at it as a danger. And so monocytes are chemo-attractively attracted uh, because of changes in the endothelial lining of the blood vessel to become attracted to it and to migrate into the wall of the artery where they transform into macrophages. The macrophages look at this LDL cholesterol and through, a pro through this process of the immune system, they, they see that as a threat and they start to phagocytize the LDL cholesterol. They're, they're trying to accumulate it and they, they become all foamy looking. They call them foam cells now and that's the, the, so we, and that's the development of the fatty streak that, that starts to happen. As this process is happening, many uh, cytokine mediated things are starting to happen one of which is the expression uh, or, or the, the movement of uh, smooth muscle cells to wall it off, number one. I'm going to put a fibrous cap over it so I can contain it. And then what happens is a substance called matrix metalloproteinase, a, a, a cytokine comes, and as a collagenase and a proteinase, it starts to dissolve the covering of the fibrous cap until uh, something happens here. I've got it sideways, I know, but just look at the vessel. Somewhere along here where the, there's a rupture in it, and now the, the contents are getting in of, of that plaque are now getting into the bloodstream. Well, think of this as a reverse scab. If I poked myself and started bleeding, I would expect that within two or three minutes it would stop, it would clot, and that if I looked at it the next day, that I'd have a scab. That's just the way nature's bandage uh, begins to heal. Because if that didn't happen, I would just sit here and leak all day, and I would lose all my blood and I would die. So nature's way is to have tissue clotting factors kick in and clot and confine and contain. The question is what happens when all those things exit the, 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 the place and get into the blood? The very same thing happens. The tissue factors create clotting that goes on and now I have a thrombus form. The deal is that what I just described can happen anywhere along wherever there is plaque in the artery. It can be at the 90% place, it could be at the 10% place. It could be I could have passed the treadmill test with flying colors. All my markers for uh, cardiovascular disease are great, um, and or all, all my signs are great, I'm healthy, and then the next day while I'm jogging, because uh, I'm a really, really healthy person, I die of a heart attack. And it's like, well, how did that happen? How did the thrombus occur, you see? We're beginning to think that maybe we understand this process a little better. Because as this, as this mass of uh, foam cells starts to build up, covered with this fibrous uh, cap, and as the MMPs kick in and the cytokine-mediated reaction starts to